the children are a sacred trust. Parents are entrusting their most precious gift of their children to the schools. That is a sacred trust that we have to honor. And um, one of the things that I'll say to the schools is, now look, we put up great uh, security systems around the school to keep out um, people that may want to do the children harm, it's, which is, I'm glad they do that. What, what are we doing to protect the minds of the children? Mm -hmm. The parents are entrusting the minds and the hearts of their children to the schools. What are we doing to instill in those minds that which is true, that which is beautiful, that which is good, that which, that which is in accord with the gospel, right? How are we bringing them in all of this to a relationship with Jesus and protecting them from that which would uh, do harm in the sense of taking them away from fidelity to the Lord? Well, Your Grace, before we discuss today's topic, I opened up Facebook this morning, and the first thing that popped up on my screen was this quote from Archbishop William Temple, who I googled. He's an Anglican archbishop from the past, and he had this really interesting quote that I wanted to get your take on. Oh, all right. And he said, your religion is what you do with your solitude. For whatever reason, it caught me. Okay, let's start with why it caught you. Why did it catch you? I think because it's an unexpected pairing of words. Religion has that community. Yep. It's this practice, there's structure to it. As a Catholic, you associate it with liturgy. But then he's pairing that with the word solitude, right? Well, obviously he'd be the one to speak to it, but it, it, it strikes me that there's a truth there, as well as obviously there's a truth in what you just said. I mean, religion is a public... Um, manifestation of a response to revelation. There's a communal dimension to this. There's a, a ritualistic dimension to this. There are rules that, that bind us. Religio is to, is to bind, right? And yet, at the heart of it all is a relationship. At the heart of it all is a relationship with the person of Jesus Christ and through him with the triune God. A relationship that, yes, finds external expression and draws us into community with other people, but at the heart of it is, is, is deeply, deeply personal, and it grows in that solitude of prayer in which we do encounter the other, the other who is Jesus. So, so I, can see, um, I can see that, I'm presuming, this is what he wants to try and, and bring out in that particular quote. That personal relationship is so key. It's the heart of it. Yeah. Well, it's a, perfect, uh, it's a perfect connection to what we are discussing today, which is Catholic education. Uh, we're anticipating at the time of this recording Catholic Education Week oh. um, coming up here in October. And talking about Catholic education, particularly around two phrases that we are two words that we often hear. Mm. Uh, one is distinct, uh, Catholic education as distinct. Here in Alberta and in other Canadian provinces, we talk about the distinction of what makes Catholic education mm -hmm. distinct, mm -hmm. partly because of the legalities. You know, we need to be distinct or we lose funding, I'm in sure a sense, why would right? We have it, yeah. yeah, why would it exist? Um, but also, what is it that makes it unique on yeah. a philosophical or, or religious uh, level? The other word is authentic, mm. right? Uh, what is it that makes Catholic education authentic as opposed to inauthentic, yep. right? Yep. And uh, I suppose we could start with that word distinct. Um, again, there's a lot of discussion around whether or not and, and how Catholic education is distinct. Sometimes that inspires a sense of trepidation in people because there's a, there's a, a desire to, to maintain the Catholic school system. Um, there's those that press up against that, right, politically. Mm -hmm. But there's also probably more to it, right, than just a political sense of the word. Why is it important for Catholic education to be distinct in your mind? Well, we have to be true to ourselves. Right? And there's, there's, um, there's a phrase that's often used within the Catholic school context, and often it's, it's up on posters that you'll see as you enter the schools. Be it known to anyone who enters this school that Christ is the reason for this school. Now, the wording could be a little bit... Um, different from what I just quoted, I was just citing it from memory, but be it known that Christ is the reason for the school. He's the heart, he's the center, right? He is the one who makes the school distinct. Everything that we do in a Catholic school aims at helping our students, 
helping our staff, helping our trustees, helping one another, all of the parents, parishes, all the stakeholders involved in Catholic education to draw into a closer, deeper union of knowledge and love with Jesus Christ. We want our students to know him, to love him, and to follow him. We want them to become lifelong disciples of the Lord. And we want them to understand that Jesus, as the word of God made flesh, the word through whom all things came to be, his reality, his truth, touches everything. Um, we're not, it's not a question of a Catholic school being Catholic because it's got a religious education class in it. I mean, public school could, could um, like a non-Catholic public school could add on a religious education class. That doesn't make it Catholic. What makes it Catholic is the, is the embrace of the truth that Jesus, because of who he is, touches everything. Right? The term that we use in the Catholic school context is permeation. Uh, not just religious education, but all the curriculum. And beyond that, I like to say, those who are involved in Catholic education, teachers, administration, students, need to be permeated by the truth of who Jesus is and, and his grace and his love. And through all of that, come to know him and follow him. That's what makes Catholic education distinct. Mm -hmm. You've had a lot of education in your life. Mm -hmm. um, you have a PhD in sacramental theology, and the prerequisite to a PhD is many, many years of study. Many. <laughs> Through all throughout <laughs> high school, undergrad, graduate degree, yep. all the way up to postgraduate. Yep. What is a memory you have of being drawn to Jesus in a classroom context? Well, now here's, okay, this is a great point because, no, I'll explain this. Thank you, by the way. You're welcome. <laughs> you know, you make a lot of good <laughs> points. Sure you do, but I'll, here's, here's, now before I was just interrupted Yeah, by that, sorry, that sorry, very, my very ego good. is getting in the way of the conversation. <laughs> um, so I'll explain this. Um, my memories of encountering Jesus in a class are limited. Okay. Because I didn't have a Catholic school education. I grew up in Nova Scotia at a time when there were no Catholic schools. Now, we did have the opportunity for the local parish to come into the school. So I still remember the parish priests or um, some of the, the religious sisters that were associated with the parish coming into school. We'd have a half hour, an hour of religious education at the end of the day, sort of as a, an add-on that the public school system allowed. Don't think you'd find that now. So my, my growing up in the faith was entirely through my connection with the parish, the catechism classes that I took there, um, taking the religious education classes as they were... Um, offered in, in the public school where I was a student. And of course, obviously the central role of the family. That was, that was my formation in the faith. It was quite distinct from the school system. Which means that when I came, first of all, I was a bishop in Ontario where we have the public, um, publicly funded Catholic school system as we do here in Alberta. So I would go to the schools there and, and here, meet with trustees, administration, staff, all talking in one way or another about how do we share the faith with the children? How do we, how do we bring them to Jesus? And I still remember thinking, pinch me, can this be real? Because that's not the school experience that I had here. So wonderful, wonderful opportunities that we do have wherever we do have the gift of publicly funded Catholic education. And I've said this very, very often, the, the danger, the risk, is that if, if that's all you've ever known and you've grown up in the system, Thank God you have. What a blessing. But the danger is to take it for granted. Mm -hmm. right? And as soon as we start taking it for granted, then we run the risk of it becoming less than it can be, less than it must be. Right? Um, and we might not be as vigilant as we need to be in terms of maintaining the Catholicity of our schools and being attentive to any voices that are out there that would uh, rather that we not have Catholic schools. Well, it strikes me, too, that in any Catholic school context, that, like you said, there is an opportunity to be incredibly bold and courageous and joyful in our proclamation of Jesus Christ yep. in this classroom context. But we're all guilty of this in different points of our lives, where we don't always take the opportunity that we have, right? For sure. And we, we take it for granted, like yep. you said. Um, so it strikes me that it's we need we want to pray for our teachers 
that they would have be emboldened with that with the Holy Spirit a, too. And I think we don't do take, need to be praying for that. For yeah, sure. don't waste what this is. <laughs> Absolutely right now. Yeah. You know, as as bishop, I get into the schools and I visit and I see how much our teachers love the children. They they really do, and there are some <laughs> truly wonderful things that are happening in our Catholic schools. Um, but it can always be better. Of course, we can always improve. And and I'm, uh, as I work now with uh, the supervis- the superintendents association, as I work now with the trustees, uh, it seems to me that there there is this this growing awareness that we've got this gift that not only has to be guarded and protected, but also deepened and strengthened. How are we going to do that? Right. And that means taking a look at. What are the gifts that we have? How do we celebrate those? How do we strengthen them? What are the challenges that face us? How do we name them? How do we face them together? All with this common purpose of receiving and celebrating the gift and strengthening it. This gift that is Catholic education, mm-hmm. in which, as you say, there is this extraordinary opportunity to bring one another more closely in union and love with, with Jesus. Mm-hmm. In terms of education in general, because there are a lot of principles of education that whether they're applied in elementary school or undergrad yeah. or high school, they're yeah. similar, right? Sure. Um, there's a lot of similarities there. When you are in your undergrad or graduate degree, do you have a, do, do you have a memory of kind of being pierced by pierced by joy or or really encountering God through an intellectual offering? You know, that's that's a great great question. I think. Um, I'm thinking of my postgraduate work, and I, I still remember um, just being so touched, I love your word, pierced, by the study of the doctrine of grace, the church's doctrine of grace, and, and how the church just continues to insist again and again and again on our absolute need for Jesus, our absolute need for his Holy Spirit, our absolute need for the providence of God the Father, that we are, that our whole life, our entire existence hinges, hinges entirely upon the mercy of God whose love holds us in existence. But more than that, you know, God's grace that will just always provide for what we need as we need it, that we are carried, we need not be afraid. And just studying that and studying how the church through her monumental magisterial uh, decisions and statements throughout the centuries, just in one way or another, uh, accentuated this. Uh, I, I just found so deeply consoling, and uh, transformative in many ways. Mm, yeah. I, I appreciate that you talked about the, we don't need to be afraid. Yeah. You said that earlier. We do not. Um, and boy, do we ever need to give that message today to the children. Well, not just the children, all the adults. There's such fear. There's such anxiety. And, and we get it. We're, we're <laughs> the world in which we find ourselves right now is just so strange. And many, many indicators of um, societal collapse, family collapse. How can, that, how can that not cause anxiety? And of course, of course, we can expect that some of those uh, collapses, uh, but particularly in, in the family, in the home, it's going to find expression in the schools. I remember visiting a uh, high school, oh, this long time ago, not long after I arrived in the archdiocese, and I was talking to the caretaker, the custodian. They see everything, right? And they, they develop beautiful, beautiful relationships with the students of support and kindness and so on. And this custodian said, pay attention, pay close attention to the number of students, growing number of students, actually, uh, that choose deliberately to come to school early and stay late. I never chose to go to school early or stay late. Well, what? But he said, no, what, what what is that indicative of? Well, they feel more at home. They feel safer in the school than at home. Right? So, so... We find as a result that a lot of the teachers are taking on responsibilities that from the outset they never really signed up for. Right? They almost almost a parental caring responsibility because they love the children and they wanna they wanna surround them with that Christian love that really has to be part and parcel of who we are. So so not to be afraid and to keep Instilling in the children the truth that Jesus who loves them is near and he's carrying them 
and carrying all of us towards the loving embrace of the Father who will provide for our every need. Uh, more and more, we always have to communicate that message, but I think more and more, given the circumstances in which we find ourselves. Yeah, I appreciate that you're, you're drawing the connection between home, the family, and, and the school, any yep. school, whether it's public, Catholic, etc. And the catechism says that the first the, the, the responsibility of education is first and foremost a parent's responsibility. And that, Fairly, yeah. I don't know if it explicitly says this, but it certainly says in, in many different ways that schools are at the service of parents Precisely. in the sense that they yeah. should never be superseding the, the, the first responsibility of yep. the parent. How can we safeguard um, the family in our schools, ensuring that that our education is never overriding p the parental responsibility. Yeah, parental, parental rights come first, and one of the things that we have structured into the into the whole system in order to honor that relationship are things like what do they call it? Um, school councils, I think, this is the proper term, whereby they 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 establish connections with the parents so that they can be hearing from the parents or sharing f with the parents what's going on in the schools because the schools. Uh, need to maintain that sense that, yes, we are at the service of the parents who are the first teachers in the faith. Um, clearly, the parents themselves will say, well, we don't know everything about the faith, or we certainly, in terms of broader education, we don't know what the latest is in math and everything else. We want our children to be well-educated. We want them to receive excellence in their education. And if they're sending them to Catholic school, we presume they also want them to be brought up in the faith and to be brought up well in the faith. Um, and, and some parents today may not feel they've got the, the knowledge or the experience in order to do that fully. Many parents do. Um, so yes, they do rely on the schools to do that. But in, in all of that, uh, the schools always have to keep in mind we stand at the service of the parents and of the family for the good of the child who has been entrusted to us. This is the thing that I'll often say, and I'll say it even though the schools get it, don't need to be reminded, but... The children are a sacred trust. Parents are entrusting their most precious gift, uh, their children, to the schools. That is a sacred trust that we have to honor. And um, one of the things that I'll say to the schools is, now look, we put up great uh, security systems around the school to keep out um, people that may want to do the children harm, it's, which is, I'm glad they do that. What, what are we doing to protect the minds of the children? Mm -hmm. The parents are entrusting the minds and the hearts of their children to the schools. What are we doing to instill in those minds that which is true, that which is beautiful, that which is good, that which, that which is in accord with the gospel, right? How are we bringing them in all of this to a relationship with Jesus and protecting them from that which would uh, do harm in the sense of taking them away from fidelity to the Lord? But all of that is in support of the parents and what then the hopes that they have for their children. Yeah, it's meant to be a symbiotic relationship. Yeah, and the there's family. a third party in all of that too. We speak about the triad. So there's school, home, but also parish. Right? So we, we, want, we don't want the schools to be substitute parents. We also don't want the schools to be substitute parishes. Right? It's in the parish that the faith is uh, lived, right? So as we share in our uh, school context, the, the, the faith of the church helped the children grow in their relationship with Jesus. It has to always be with an eye to strengthening their own personal connection and the familial connection with the parish where the faith typically is lived out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You and your brother bishops from Alberta and the Northwest Territories uh, published a letter that you all signed for this Catholic Education Week. Mm, we do that every year. Yeah, and the theme for Catholic Education Week uh, this year in October is testify. Mm -hmm. Have an answer for your faith. Yeah, testify. And actually, one of the things that stood out to me about that letter was there's a segment, and I encourage people to read it, it's in the show notes, is you note that there is an urgency to proclaiming the gospel mm -hmm. to the children. And especially in light of, as you've already mentioned, how rampant anxiety, depression, this mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. encroaching sense of despair that is manifest in so many children and teenagers. It's yeah. really evident if you go to a school, um, and maybe there's people listening right now who are in that state of just, it 
it's almost inexplicable, this sense of just despair that is almost cultural at this point. Why urgency? Why did you use well, that you, term? You, yeah. Well, you just, you just gave the reason. Right? Yeah. So in a sense, it's always urgent because we always want people to know Jesus Christ. He is the reason for our hope. He is the one who alone is the light of the world. And to go back to John Paul II, right? Jesus Christ is the answer to the question that's every human life. He's, he's it. Whatever, whatever questions are troubling us, whatever are challenges, I mean, go to him. Just go to him. And in that encounter with him and with his love, all becomes clear, all right? And, and the anxiety does get replaced with a sense of peace that, that grows from this act of trusting in him. So we always need that. We always need to be reminded of it. But when we do see the sense of anxiety, and yes, sometimes it does boil over and degenerate into despair. Whenever we see that and if we see it growing, then that just deepens the urgency of letting people know that it doesn't need to be like this. There is another way, and the way is a person, Jesus. There's another answer, and the answer is a person, Jesus. Go to him. And those that have come to know the Lord and the joy and the hope that he gives, we do have that responsibility of sharing it with others, the, testif the testifying, the, uh, the witness right? That, that we are all called to give. It strikes me, too, that in Scripture, it doesn't say that Jesus Christ is a reason for our hope, it says in many ways he is the reason for the our hope. Insists, so the stakes are high. The church <laughs> insists on the definite article. Jesus is not an indefinite article. Right? He is the savior. Mm -hmm. He is the reason. He is the hope. He's it. Mm -hmm. right? uh, and we have to insist on that because it is the truth. Mm -hmm. And that truth and our awareness of the truth and being having been seized by that truth... Mm -hmm. The Christian is someone who's been seized by the truth of who Jesus is and follows him. That leads us to that urgency of just making him known. And in some sense, uh, despair is reasonable if you've extracted Jesus from reality. Mm -hmm. There's, I've often thought about this when I see this pandemic of mental health, as you might uh, articulate it. Because in, in a sense, we've, we've tried, we or many different forces in our communities have sought to scrub God, yeah. uh, eternity, Jesus Christ from our whole framework of reality. And it may not be the sole cause of someone's despair, certainly, uh, but in some sense, it makes sense to me. If you don't, if we truly are teaching our children or implying to our children that there is no eternity, that you were not created by an all-loving creator. Yeah. Um, that Jesus Christ is a myth. It seems reasonable to be incredibly anxious and and seems sad. Inevitable. Well, inevitable. Inevitable. For yeah. sure. And the indigenous people just teach us something here so important that I've always been touched by that. They refuse to eclipse the creator. Absolutely refuse. Doesn't matter what context in which they find themselves. It could be high-level government uh, discussions, right? We're going to pray first, and we're going to acknowledge the Creator. And as Benedict XVI would say, you know, without the Creator, the creature obviously ceases to exist, right? If we if we eclipse from our own um, points of reference, God as Creator, as the one who loves us, God as Redeemer, we're not, what are we left with? We're left with no points of reference, right? And we're just left floundering and alone and adrift. All those terms, and that cannot but help lead to despair. Mm -hmm. the widespread nihilism that's, that's out there right now. There's no meaning to anything. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. But there is. And the meaning is Jesus. It's found in him. We talked about distinction. Or legal, legally, it's important to be distinct as a Catholic school system, right? Because if we're not distinct, then it kind of <laughs> scrubs any sure, purpose of, of sure, existence, right. right? So we want to sure. be distinct. Um, and it's also by being distinct, we're a witness to Jesus Christ, yes, right? Absolutely. Um, if we take away what makes us unique, then in a, in a sense, we're taking away Jesus Christ. Yeah. Authentic is the other word that we're framing this discussion around. I often hear it, um, uh, that term used in just car common discussions about mm -hmm. Catholic uh, mm -hmm. Catholicism, the Catholic school system. I hear the word authentic and I think about its opposite, inauthentic. Mm. 
Uh, if we can have authentic Catholic education, that implies that we can and sometimes do have inauthentic Catholic education, uh, perhaps of our own fault. What does that mean? What, what's the, what does authentic as opposed to inauthentic Catholic education look like? Well, first of all, it's related to the term distinct. If we are authentic, then we certainly will be distinct. Right. Um, you know, how do I put this simply? We're true to our advertising. We're true to what we say. Mm -hmm. right? And we say that we are a community centered upon Jesus Christ, faithful to his teachings, uh, seeking to grow in that knowledge and to share it with one another and so on. So authentic means being true to Jesus, true to the gospel, true to what it means to, to the Catholic identity, true to the Catholic mission. Um, there's always the possibility, and this has always existed in the church and prior to the church, that whenever we find ourselves immersed in um, environments that are other than Christian, other than the gospel, um, environments whose messaging can be very, very persuasive and powerful, especially today in the world of multimedia, all these things. It's so easy to fall into that messaging. We're we can be vulnerable to it, you know, and accept it. And that can, that can easily find its way through the, if it makes its way into the hearts and minds of people who are part and parcel of our Catholic institutions, it's, it's in that way that it finds its way into our institutions also. So we always have to be on the guard against that. And even when I said prior to the church, what I meant was the history of the, um, our ancestors in the faith, the Jewish people, right? They made it into the to the promised land, and yet they always they found themselves there, surrounded by other people that were worshiping and following other gods. And the and the warning of the prophets was always stay true, stay true, stay true. Don't follow these other ways of thinking, other ways of living, however seductive, however attractive it they might be made. To. We have the same thing. Today, we've always had that same thing. Whenever, whenever the church finds herself surrounded by other ways of life or thinking that are contrary to the gospel, especially when they have seductive messaging, we can all fall prey to that, and it can make, our, make its way uh, in that way through, into our institutions. So let's be realistic about that. Let's understand very clearly what it means to be a Catholic institution, in this case, the schools, let's, and let's be... Let's be very clear about what could uh, be counteracting our fidelity. Name it, and then in charity and in truth, deal with it. Mm -hmm. And in this way, remain authentic. Here in Alberta, but also in many different uh, provinces and states in America, there's, there's a lot of um, discussion in education circles about uh, how to teach anthropology mm -hmm. and sexuality mm -hmm. in yeah, schools, yeah. right? And I mean, speaking of distinction, the Catholic Church's teachings on theology of the body, sexuality are very yep. distinct from our cultural yep. norms, very yep. distinct. And sometimes there can be um, trepidation. And I've talked to teachers who feel a nervousness about proclaiming what our faith teaches, what scripture teaches about yep. marriage, sexuality, um, what the catechism teaches, even in cla Catholic classrooms, because, you know, when you get up in front of students, you, there, I mean, there's, people have phones, that you, what you say, you are often held accountable yeah. for, right? It's very yeah. public, you, and you would be very familiar with that yourself. What words of encouragement would you give to a teacher or someone writing the curriculum for Catholic schools? Yeah. Um, yeah, what, uh, what words would you offer them if they're feeling any sense of concern or fear uh, for proclaiming what the church teaches yeah. in and that in, way? In fact, I've, that's, that's a great question. In fact, you know, when I've been with, let's say, a group of school administrators, so, so, so they, they want to talk about this, and I think they should, and I'm happy to talk about it. And the first thing I always say is, for heaven's sake, calm down. <laughs> really, because these are topics that as soon as they're raised, everybody starts to tense up. Yeah. for whatever reason, uh, calm down, relax. We can look at this rationally and logically and unapologetically and l take a look at what the church says. Delve into it. Don't be afraid to, to, to delve into it and you will find how beautiful it is and how true it is and how it accords with reality. Right? So study it, move into it, Embrace it, 
and not be afraid to talk about it calmly and rationally. Um, now, yes, it's going to meet with some resistance, going to meet with some reaction, especially, you know, in a school classroom where the, the, the teacher is dedicated to caring for the student, loving the student, and maybe the student, for a whole host of different reasons, might be grappling with the issues. Um, it could be the, a personal grappling with, with an issue. It could be they're just trying to figure something out because of what they've heard out, outside the school and all of this. And so... What what emerges from all of that is is that if you if you challenge my thinking, if you challenge my um, way of approaching a topic, you're therefore challenging me and attacking me. But but no no no, we we have to always make the the fundamental distinction between the person and the idea. Right? We want to challenge your ideas, challenge your thoughts, always loving you as a person, and helping you to come to know the joy and the beauty, of the truth that is the, the Catholic doctrine on this or whatever whatever the issue might be. That takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of patience, it takes a lot of deep inner conviction, right? Um, but I think arriving at that point begins by just calming down, <laughs> relaxing, and not being afraid to look at the truth of things and, and talk about it rationally and lovingly with one another. I always I think of St. Paul when he, I don't know the exact quote where he said, basically, the Holy Spirit will give you the words you need. Yeah. Be not afraid. And he's standing before various governments or or people who were judging him and wished his death in yeah. some cases. Yeah, yeah. But he, he really trusted that the Holy Spirit will give me the words I need when I need it. And perhaps that's a word for our teachers, our superintendents saying, maybe we're, in some sense, maybe we're overthinking yeah. Um, how to yeah. proclaim yeah. Uh, the church's teaching on sexuality because the Lord is your defender. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Don't be the, rash, but well, also did the I Lord tell, will defend you. Did I tell the story? I'm going to tell the story in the context of this podcast at one point of a parishioner in Nova Scotia. She was in the parish that I had, and she had to face a difficult situation. I think it was in her family, and she had to confront a particular issue that was very, very sensitive. And before going into it, her prayer was simply this, Holy Spirit, land on my tongue. Mm -hmm. I have used that so often. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not to say you don't go into a situation prepared. Make sure you understand what's at stake, what the issues are, and what the church teaches, and so on. But at the end of the day, we do rely on, on the Lord to give us the words that, are not, that will help articulate well what we want to say, but also that will land well within the hearing of the one who's receiving the message. The Spirit works within the speaker and the one who's receiving the message also so that it lands well in such a way that they're open to the beauty of the truth. It doesn't always land well, of course. Well, <laughs> we pray, maybe not in the moment. Yes. Maybe not in the moment, but you plant the seed and pray that that, that seed is going to deepen and expand within the hearing of the individual. Well, sure, if someone has been deeply immersed in a certain messaging or a certain mindset that's opposite to that of the gospel, we can expect it's going to take a little bit of time and we need to be patient with one another, but always holding to the truth of what the church teaches on whatever the particular issue is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, stand true to the faith. Stand true. Yeah. Well, Your Grace, thank you for this conversation. Yeah, well, thank, thanks yeah. for raising it. Yeah, yeah I'm no, glad to be part of this. Yeah, and you, you're the Catholic education liaison for the Alberta right now, bishops. Right now, I am, yeah. yeah, so you really have a, a, a role of leadership and guidance in regards mm -hmm. to Catholic education, mm -hmm. and we're grateful for you being a guardian to, um, yeah, the education system. Oh, in that and way. It's, a, it's a blessing for me too because it's giving me direct um, encounters with uh, people involved in the governance and the administration of the schools, and and so I'm seeing firsthand just so so many people that want to get this right and want to make it work. So we really are working to develop and strengthen those relationships among all the different stakeholders for the sake of, well, I was going to say for the sake of our schools, yes, but ultimately for the sake of those students that are entrusted to our care. Well, I will, I'll continue to pray for you and all, Thank of, you. all Thank of the you. people that are working in our Catholic schools for courage and peace and proclaiming the gospel. Great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So thanks, everybody, for watching. Hope you found it helpful along your, your journey of faith, please know that I'm praying for you. And if you would, be so kind as to pray for us also. Every blessing to you. God bless.